Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks very much to the Alexander Hamilton Institute for inviting me to do their annual Columbus Day lecture. In this talk, I'm going to look at some of the major charges against Christopher Columbus, particularly his administration on the island of Hispaniola, with an aim to sorting fact from fiction. Today, Hispaniola houses the countries of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Santo Domingo, which is the capital city of the Dominican Republic, was founded by Columbus's successor. It's considered the oldest European-founded settlement in the New World. On the island of Hispaniola, the Spanish are accused of having committed a number of atrocious crimes. And in today's lecture, we'll look into the realities behind some of these claims. Claims that frankly are hyped by journalists and historians alike, often for political purposes, rather than for the purpose of understanding the actual truth. To begin, it's arguable that the American public has never been that much into Columbus Day. A recent survey suggests that only about 14% of businesses closed the last time Columbus Day came around. A version of it was celebrated in 1792 and again in 1892, but this only happened in the aftermath of the lynching of 11 Italian Americans in New Orleans. It took until 1934 for Congress to recommend that the holiday be celebrated once more at the uh, insistence of Italian American groups. And it wasn't until 1968 that President Johnson bowed to pressure uh, in order to institute Columbus Day as a federally mandated holiday. Today, it's one of only 11 on the federal calendar. In the United States, then, it's been Italian Americans who provided the driving force behind Columbus Day. The statue of Columbus that was unceremoniously toppled into Baltimore Harbor in 2020, for example, had been placed there in 1984 by the city's Italian uh, American community. The community's rationale for promoting Columbus Day is understandable. For many decades, they were persecuted and sometimes even murdered because of their religion and other stereotypes. My own grandfather from a Protestant family was forbidden by his parents to marry my Italian Catholic grandmother, though fortunately for me, he didn't listen. In the face of such prejudice, the community hoped that by reminding Americans that Columbus is the ultimate founder of the United States, that they might thereby win acceptance into the mainstream. Perhaps they should have just offered an excuse to drink copious amounts of beer like the Irish did on St. Patrick's Day, and their holiday would have caught on more rapidly. But in all seriousness, it's ironic that Columbus Day is seen as a sort of celebration of European genocide in some quarters when originally it was embraced by a persecuted minority, trying to find a way to fit into the mainstream of American society by showing their patriotism. The main reason, of course, to celebrate Columbus Day is because Columbus's voyage ultimately made European settlement in the New World possible. Overall, this is much more good than bad, as we're going to see over the course of this lecture. Columbus is therefore the, the founder of the United States in some ways. Even for those who don't find Columbus's voyage uh, problematic, Columbus has always had to compete with more immediate founders of America, of course. This includes the Patriots of 1776 and 1783, while the origins of the U.S. proper are ascribed to the Pilgrim Fathers with their Thanksgiving celebrations and to the founders of Jamestown in Virginia, who provided us with founding myths such as the legend of Pocahontas and James Smith. Most Americans probably don't realize why we celebrate Columbus Day on October 12th or thereabouts. I myself might have guessed that this was Columbus's birthday, or maybe the day was just randomly chosen to fill in a gap in the U.S. holiday calendar. And this despite the fact that I've read Columbus's diaries several times over the years. As I've come to learn while investigating the hype around European colonialism, however, October 12th is the day that Columbus supposedly first set foot on an island in the Bahamas. The first time that any European set foot in the New World, uh, not counting the Vikings, of course, in Newfoundland and Canada. 
Um, in reality, Columbus may have set foot a day or two on either side of this, given the vagaries of the calendar since then. But, you know, so be it. October 12th is, uh, is close enough. Most Americans also don't realize that Columbus Day also has a, a large tradition of being celebrated throughout Latin America, not just in the United States. It turns out that during the high point of nationalism in the early 20th century, many countries across the world were searching for national mythologies for themselves, ones they could promote to their publics. And especially to the students in their newly organized uh, public school systems. So it was that perhaps taking a cue from communities in the US, various Latin American countries began to celebrate Columbus Day as well. In the Latin American case, the day is generally known as the Dia de la Raza, or the Day of the Hispanic Race. And this might sound again a little bit iffy to us in, in uh, today's uh, world, but it's partly because the day was named in the language of the 1910s and 20s, when the idea of race was considered cutting edge science. Since the turn of the millennium, however, many Latin American countries have renamed their race days to emphasize indigenous people and diversity more, which in all honesty is fair enough. Now, this concept of the day of the Hispanic race might sound curious to Anglophones until we remember that in many Latin American countries, for example, in Mexico, the population hovers around 70% uh, mixed race European and indigenous people. Another 15% are pure Europeans and another 15% are pure indigenous. So most of the people are mixed race. That is to say, Latin Americans have long recognized that they themselves are a product of one of the most successful experiments in racial amalgamation in recent centuries anywhere on the globe. For this reason, Latin Americans have been loath to disparage the voyages of Columbus and European colonialism quite as much as Anglophones do. Latin Americans are also more aware of some of the nuances of Spanish and Brazilian rule in the Americas. While there's plenty to lament, and there has been and still is plenty of racism against indigenous and darker skinned people in those parts of the world, they recognize that indigenous culture had plenty of flaws as well, including human sacrifice, mass slavery, warfare, genocide, and pretty much any nasty habit that any human society's ever had. They're also aware of the Pax Hispanica in Latin America, a peace that Spain imposed on people previously racked by petty warfare. And they're aware of many other benefits brought via the Spanish from the old world. These benefits increase technology levels in the new world by several millennia uh, over the course of a single generation. And this is part of the reason why we see relatively less backlash against Columbus in the Latin American world. The United States and the Anglophone world, however, are vastly different stories. In recent years, it seems that the main purpose of Columbus Day has been to inaugurate an open season, not only on Christopher Columbus, but on all European exploration, and indeed Europe and the West in general. This open season begins around Columbus Day and culminates every year in Thanksgiving uh, in an orgy of newspaper and magazine articles lamenting some new atrocity committed by Europeans, of course, against indigenous people. These tales of European atrocity are often taken by journalists from the pages of certain activist historians, some of, uh, some of whom we'll meet in a moment. It's the purpose of this talk to address some of the major charges laid against Columbus and the Spanish administration on Hispaniola. Charges laid by these historians and journalists, and we're going to investigate whether the historical bias of those charges uh, really supports the charges or not. For example, uh, a historian named John Henrik Clark assures us that, and I quote, Columbus was a thief and invader, an organizer of rape of Indian women, a slave trader, a reactionary religious fanatic, and the personal director of a campaign for mass murder of defenseless peoples. Doesn't make Columbus sound uh, very nice, really. David Stenard, in his once ignored but now increasingly influential book called American Holocaust, 
this was published in 1992, Stenard suggests that what happened on Hispaniola, quote, was the equivalent of 50 Hiroshima bombs. In this, Stenard is repeating the oft-heard claim that Hispaniola had something like 8 million people living there in 1491, a population that was reduced to a mere 30,000 by the 1540s. This large population figure is also mentioned on the U.S. government website Native Voices, which claims that over 7 million natives were killed by Columbus and his successors on Hispaniola alone. So not only is Columbus charged with genocide, but he's also seen as a sort of harbinger of a European system of capitalist exploitation, a set of oppressive, soul-crushing human relations of which indigenous peoples were happily ignorant. As the editors of a left-leading academic journal called Social Justice wrote on the uh, 500th anniversary of Columbus's voyage in 1992, Columbus and subsequent invaders set in motion a world historic process of European colonization by which a nascent capitalist system expanded monumentally across the earth in the Americas, Africa, and Asia. It was a process based on human and environmental exploitation, the legacies of which continue to this day. The merciless assault on indigenous peoples served as the bedrock upon which Western culture and the capitalist economy were built in the Americas. So again, the merciless assault on indigenous peoples served as the bedrock upon which Western culture and the capitalist economy were built in the Americas. That's quite a charm. And the editors conclude by saying, today's environmental crisis results from 500 years of unbridled capitalist exploitation. Progress has not come without a staggering price, if it can be called progress at all. So to prove this point that Europeans were uniquely exploitative and ready to commit the sin of progress, while the natives were gentle-kind and egalitarian, Howard Zinn, in his People's History of the United States, refers to a cherry-picked set of references from Columbus's journals. This set of references runs as follows. It's kind of been uh, run together and is quoted often uh, on the internet. The natives willingly trade us everything they owned. They do not bear arms and do not know them. For I showed them a sword and they took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They will make fine slaves. With 50 men, we can subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. This quotation is taken up in the TV show Yellowstone, where the Native American teacher reads these lines to her class and then asks a white male student, and I quote, Trent, the student in question, do you ever feel like making someone do what you want, whether they want to or not? It's a very European mentality stemming from the oppressive political and religious structures of the Renaissance. Kings and priests with absolute power ruling masses who have none. That was the mentality of the man who discovered America, and it's the mentality of our society which it struggles with today. Phew. So as we can see from this selection of accusations against Columbus, the charges are legion. They range from, range from the personal, what Columbus actually did, systemic, and even to the metaphysical or spiritual. So let's lay the most pertinent of against Columbus out and then them turn, looking at the historical record uh, behind them. First and foremost, Columbus is charged with the genocide of millions of people in a short uh, generation or two. Secondly, Columbus is charged with slavery and, and beginning the African slave trade. Third, he's charged with inaugurating a system of settler colonialism, quote unquote, which aimed to displace natives and replace them with more compliant European workers. Fourth, Columbus is charged with exporting a system of hierarchy and exploitation, which ended up mapping over indigenous systems of cooperation and egalitarianism. So we have genocide, slavery, settler colonialism, and capitalist exploitation. In this lecture, we only have time to focus in depth on a single charge, that of genocide, 
But I want to use that to set the stage to reevaluate the other three charges right at the end of the talk. What about the charge of genocide, though? Much of the basis for this charge, as it turns out, is based on the work of a single pair of scholars, Cook and Bora, who were writing their seminal works in the 1970s. They used a lot of graphs and equations in order to extrapolate from very little data a population figure which raised the previous estimate by a figure of 10 times or more. As pointed out by David Hennega in his article on the contact population of Hispaniola, history as higher mathematics, many historians were willing to be cowed by anyone who brought such scary looking equations into their work. Lacking even the most basic familiarity with statistical methods, these historians felt too embarrassed to question Cook and Bora's work. Even when it raised pre-contact figures from a few hundred thousand to the staggering figure of eight million. As Henneke also hints, but is too afraid, I think, to say outright, the other main reason why Cook and Bora's maximalist estimate of 8 million people on that island became so widely accepted is uh, simple politics. Now, when Howard Zinn wrote his People's History of the United States back in the 1970s, he was still using the pre-Cook and Bora figure, with the result that he ends up quoting a population figure for Hispaniola of only a quarter of a million people. Meanwhile, when David Stenard wrote American Holocaust in the later 1980s, he was very happy to jump on the Cook and Bora bandwagon and, and quote a figure of 8 million people. This, uh, it was based on this that Stenard then claimed that what happened on Hispaniola was the equivalent of 50 Hiroshima bombs. Stenard was using a figure of about 120,000 killed for a single Hiroshima bomb. Uh, this was the number of casualties, but not actually the number killed, which was closer to 50,000, but uh, we won't uh, quibble with him here, although his numbers are often filled with those kind of logical uh, and factual problems. At any rate, even before Cook and Bora, Howard Zinn thought it terrible enough that Columbus and subsequent Spanish administrators had reduced the population of Hispaniola from a quarter of a million to 30,000 in the course of a few decades. But now, sensationalists all across the internet routinely quote this figure of 7 or 8 million people on Hispaniola in 1491. Since the figure of about 30,000 in the mid-1500s uh, is somewhat more certain and believable, then it really does look as though Columbus and his successors were responsible for the deaths of millions upon millions of natives. Now, all of this should beg the question, how reliable is this figure of seven or eight million put forth by Cook and Bora? Since the natives of Hispaniola were pre-literate, they kept no records. So this means we have to rely on archaeology in order to get a pre-contact population estimate. This is what Cook and Bora did when they arrived at their own figure. Now, how does a historical demographer actually come up with a population figure from archaeological evidence? In fact, the best that we can do is the remaining number of settlements that, that we uh, know about. We then multiply the number of known settlements with some number that we imagine represents the number of settlements that have been lost to us. In other words, if we know that there were about 10 settlements in this region and we have evidence for that, then we have to assume as archaeologists that there were at least some settlements that we don't know about. The question then becomes, what percentage have been lost? Does our known sample represent 10% of the real number or 90%? Now, we can make a guess based on better known or better attested samples, but in the end, this is all just guesswork. Meanwhile, within existing settlements, we need to know how many houses there were. We might be missing a good proportion of the houses. So what multiplier do we use to count them? And then we're left with another conundrum, how many people lived in each house? What was the uh, number of people in each household? So again, you have to arrive at a multiplier. Through a process of multiplying multipliers, you can see how demographers can easily arrive at a figure 10 times or more the real number of uh, people on a given island or in a given area. And if, like Cook and Bora, you're politically motivated 
to make a given culture look more numerous and therefore more advanced than it in fact was, then fudging these figures becomes all the easier. Certainly, this is what Charles C. Mann did in his best-selling book, 1491, when he posited that Native Americans across the New World were living in thriving city-states, when in fact the city-state area, while growing, remained surprisingly small by the time the Spanish arrived. Specialists invariably poo-poo man's claim to have discovered a teeming new world that specialists overlook. But frankly, much to uh, of online backlash to say anything very pointed against man's work. In a case of this, however, a man's razor and some logic and common sense could help historians avoid wild errors like Cook and Bora have obviously committed. For one thing, you have to look at the size of the area that you're talking about. Hispaniola is about 60% the size of England minus Scotland and Wales. We know that England circa 1500 had about 2 million people in it. So Cook and Bora therefore posit that Hispaniola had a population density at least 500% thicker than contemporary England. Now, is that plausible? we then have to look at the kind of food production that was going on in England and Hispaniola. So Hispaniola natives were, quote, hoe farmers using stone tools, growing a limited number of crops with no draft animals, no metal, and no plows. Historically, this provides far fewer calories per acre than a heavy plow cereal regime such as contemporary England has. And we have evidence from many eyewitnesses who said that the Hispaniola natives ate very little and spent much time sitting on the ground to conserve calories. The Spanish ate about four times as many calories by one believable estimate as the indigenous Hispaniolans were eating per day. Thus, it came as no surprise to me at least when an article in the New York Times called Ancient DNA is Changing How We Think About the Caribbean which was published in December 2020, showed that recent genetic studies had returned an estimate of only a, quote, few tens of thousands of natives on Hispaniola in 1491. These genetic studies further showed a high survival of Taino Indian genes, coupled with a high level of genetic diversity, meaning there had been no population bottleneck and a lot of intermarriage. So let's take a moment to take in the full significance of this genetic study, which for some reason has not been taken up by the journalists and historians writing about Columbus or Hispaniola. Genetic studies are finally now able to show us the true pre-contact population of Hispaniola, and they suggest that the population might have been almost exactly the same in 1491 as it was in the 1530s when uh, Las Casas lamented how few Indians there were. In other words, the native population level, according to genetic evidence that is now very hard to dispute, has been wildly overestimated, even by the lowball minimalist figures like Howard Zinn was using. And the maximalists, according to this study, have been proven wildly, even laughably wrong. I mean, 8 million. Uh, you just have to look at, you know, for example, contemporary England to see that would be impossible. And as we've said, the evidence points to interbreeding at a very high level, for which there's also ample documentary evidence. We know that within a generation or two, there were many mixed race families, not only on Hispaniola, but across uh, the Latin American world. And all of this goes along with the fact that according to our sources on Columbus, the wars that he instituted had a small number of casualties, maybe in the hundreds, maximally a thousand or two casualties. These are small scale wars. They're run only by a few hundred Spaniards and their allies. The idea that these people could have slaughtered millions of people or would have wanted to try to waste this many human resources uh, is patently ridiculous. Much more important to the Spanish was getting natives to work for them on farms, similar to how the peasants in Spain worked for the nobility. Wealth was based on having people to work for you. Why would you want to uh, kill them off? So that was the model in their heads, nothing more sinister than that. Sometimes, of course, Spanish masters were cruel and racist and uh, even murderous on occasion. 
But many times cruelty and racism were checked by a number of forces, including the church, the crown, uh, and the fact that many Spaniards were taking native wives. In fact, the Spanish crown uh, uh, repeatedly cracked down on anti-native cruelty. There was a widespread belief amongst the conquistadors, almost entirely ignored today, that if you married a native princess, so the daughter of a chieftain, that this would give a Spaniard a title to nobility, so uh, uh, the right to be called an hidalgo, a nobleman. Since this was the most valued thing of all in Spanish society at the time, this indicates that the Spanish took very seriously the native social structures. They actually regarded native nobility as superior to the Spanish rank and file. And this, it will be noted, is the very opposite of racism. So when we realize on what shaky foundations the genocide claim against Columbus rests, I mean, people claiming millions killed when in fact we're maybe talking uh, a couple thousand. Then we might begin to suspect that the rest of the main charges against Columbus are on equally shaky ground. Columbus did authorize two boatloads of several hundred slaves, perhaps 600 in total, to be shipped back to Spain. This is true. But it's also true that Columbus did this against the express will of Queen Isabella, and he only did it at the behest of creditors who were furious at the fact that they were losing money uh, on Columbus's colony. Columbus consented to shipping these natives because these natives had just declared war on his colony and had been captured during that war. It was common in the Mediterranean at uh, that time for both Christians and Muslims to capture each other and then sell each other as slaves if they were caught in war. So this was going on in Spain and the Mediterranean uh, uh, all, all across the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And the same held true in Africa, where Europeans were beginning to trade. If people got captured in war, they were sold. So this was not a European-only practice at the day. That's, that's a ridiculous misconception. In the event, Isabella was so furious with Columbus for consenting uh, to this uh, shipment that she had all of the slaves ransom and shipped back to the New World. Columbus never regained full favor from the queen after this stunt. But it's arguable that he never even would have made this one shipment had creditors uh, and the exigencies of war not forced his hand. What about the charge that Columbus was the harbinger for a uniquely evil European system of settler colonialism designed to replace the natives with docile uh, European workers? What most people don't know is that already in 1542, the Spanish crown published a series of laws for the protection of the Indians, which was a landmark set of human rights legislation for their day. This did away with the exploitative encomienda system and went a long way towards normalizing the rights of natives. After the passage of these laws, native population rates began an increase, which they've maintained to the present day. Not only this, but the Spanish set up a series of Repúblicas de Indios across the New World, in which it was illegal for non-Indians to own land. This went a long way towards preserving the indigenous communities which still exist today. Rather than exterminate the natives, then, this policy shows a deliberate attempt to increase Indian population levels within a few decades of the Spanish arriving. The Spanish of the early modern period were well aware that national power, again, came from high population levels. The monarchs were fully on board with maximizing the Indian population throughout the colonial period. This brought them military security, amongst other things. So again, the idea that Columbus was the harbinger of a European system designed to replace natives seems uh, laughable when you look at what actually happened in colonial Latin America. And again, when we see that today, the vast majority of Latin Americans uh, are either indigenous or mixed race, then again, this gives the lie to this idea of settler colonialism. As for our fourth and final charge, the one that indigenous people were egalitarian while Europeans were hierarchical, one need only look at Aztec society to see precisely the sort of stratified hierarchical society that we find in Europe, the things that many people are lamenting against. 
So when Native Americans did build city-states, they became just as hierarchical as anyone else on earth who lived in a city-state. So their societies were, if anything, a little more brutal with less developed human rights, less developed hum uh, women's rights than we find in Europe at the end of the Middle Ages. Cortez himself was gifted uh, 20 slave women uh, by a chief uh, as a present when he landed uh, in the Yucatan. And uh, this was just absolutely normal to treat women as pawns, uh, sex slaves, uh, and, and prizes to be traded amongst male chiefs. One final thing that I haven't been able to mention is the question of Columbus's uh, religious zealotry, but we can deal with that in a few strokes. You remember that uh, one of our accusers at the beginning, Clark, was saying uh, that Columbus was a religious zealot and the idea is that he was kind of burning people at the stake. Columbus did, in fact, become increasingly uh, religious in his later years, but a lot of this revolved around the idea that he himself had been a sort of chosen one who was chosen to bring Christianity to the new world. Uh, he saw himself as a sort of ocean-going Marco Polo. Now, this may sound maybe ominous to people who are, are scared of that kind of idea, but let's look more closely at, at his actual trajectory. As a younger man, Columbus had been a successful businessman and rather pragmatic. Historians speculate that as he dealt more closely with Queen Isabella of Spain, he began to adapt more religious language because he realized that this was the way that the queen was thinking. In other words, Columbus the salesman learned to use the language of the people he was trying to convince. Columbus is on record as saying that converts are won more by example than by force. And indeed, this was common wisdom in Spain, where they learned the hard way that converting Jews and Muslims against their will almost always backfired. In any event, the 1520s would witness millions of voluntary conversions of indigenous Mexicans to Christianity, especially in the wake of the Our Lady of Guadalupe miracle. Conversion at sword point proved more or less entirely unnecessary, and both natives and priests were willing to accommodate one another's beliefs in what ended up being a rather pragmatic, non-confrontational religious situation with a lot of syncretism going on where saints and uh, uh, Aztec deities were, were melded together. So for all of these reasons, then, the main charges against Columbus should be viewed with a great deal of suspicion. It would be far better for us to turn the clock back and look at Columbus as a flawed but ultimately great man, like we used to do in the 1990s, when the anti-European bandwagon really got rolling. After all, Columbus's voyage galvanized our modern global society. It stimulated the scientific revolution and thereby the industrial revolution, which forms the basis of all modern prosperity. Columbus was an intrepid explorer and unparalleled navigator, and for all of these reasons, he deserves our praise. In my new book, which is called Not Stolen, The Truth About European Colonialism in the New World, I address these and a number of other shibboleths that many of my colleagues like to spout about European colonialism. Chapter by chapter, I painstakingly point out just how novel and fringe a lot of these interpretations are, uh, and how only a few years ago, most historians simply didn't believe them or take them seriously. So I hope that you are, uh, if you were inspired by this talk, that you'll pick up a copy and find it a breath of fresh air, a respite from the relentlessly negative view of Columbus and of European exploration that we've heard uh, from the historical profession. Thanks very much.